first question for you guys is, the financial services market is often subject to intense regulation that at the same time differ from country to country. How do fintech prepare to scale and deal with the different markets without losing the agility and competitiveness? Go ahead. Uh, you can you can hear it? Yes, it's fine. Okay. Uh, yes, it is definitely a big it's a definitely a big issue. Uh, regulation is a big issue in all the techs. You usually speaking as we can as we can see today. Um, it depends on the countries. What I advise because a lot of my customers are, are fintech here in uh, in Toronto on Bay Street. Uh, what I strongly advise to do two years ago, actually when it started, was to anticipate the regulation. Uh, when there is a void, your, um, your strength is going to come from preempting the ground where you have the void. Don't let someone else make the decision for you. So it led to the creation here in Toronto to an association of fintech, and they are working in putting themselves the regulation that they will auto-decide to impose to themselves demonstrating that they are, uh, that they are responsible actors in the industry, so they will do the job of the regulator. So when the regulator is coming, the job is already done, so they will avoid the risk of being imposed something that they don't like and they don't want. And after that, if there is something in the borderline, it can be negotiated, but they will start uh, with a very, very strong position. So. That's a way to deal with the lack of regulation because you cannot live with the idea that there will never be regulation. It's impossible. The regulator is looking at it and one day is going to do something. So anticipate it. Gary, what did you yeah. think about that? Yeah, I think it's... Uh, so I'm, I come from uh, having spent some time at OnDeck, which is a U.S.-based uh, fintech lender, small business lender, uh, New York-based, uh, and expanded into Australia and into Canada from their U.S. base. And certainly the... Uh, there was a real sense of different regulations impacting the ability to, you know, roll a platform out. So it's a it's a real concern even within Canada. There are different regulatory bodies in Quebec versus Ontario and what have you. But uh, you know, I think it's a fact that it's part of the business. Uh, as Roger says, it's uh, I think part of the game. Certainly, to stay ahead of uh, punitive regulations is to do what. This association, and I'm not sure which one that is at the Mars uh, FinTech group you were talking about. It's part of it, yeah. Yeah. Um, and an association that I'm part of, that Gary Schwartz, who, who I'm standing in for today, is leading called the Canadian Lenders Association. It's certainly something we're doing with things like Smartbox, which is a, a, an effort to try to get ahead of regulation by bringing uh, a real uh, similarity and, and ease of use for applying for loans and having that be easily comparable between lenders. So I think, yeah, two ways to think about it. One is is getting ahead of it through the associations and thinking about it ahead of time and not waiting for it to happen to the industry. And the second thing, though, I would say is that we, within the association, are seeing a lot more collaboration, I think, globally. So there's a lot more talking about uh, what's going on on a global basis. Canada is much more aware now as a country than they have ever been of the gaps that exist with challenges around open data and other regulatory regimes that exist. So I think all of that is is in the is changing. I think it's getting more open, and it'll happen because fintechs drive the conversation a little bit, and consumers demand it. Uh, talking about that, uh, probably following up that what you said about associations. Uh, there are several associations in Latin America and here as well where, you know, we have different fintech companies trying to, uh, you know, like uh, support each other. Do you guys at some point are the voice with the government, for example, to kind of like uh, help to uh, with regulations, for example? Or how, how do you da do that, that communication with the government, for example? Uh, or... You know, just to fill up those cups. Yeah, I mean, there was a, last fall there was an effort by the Competition Bureau, I think, and the, the, uh, to reach out to fintechs to ask them what was going on in the space. There's, there's been outreach and consultation with uh, with banks, with fintechs, et cetera, to talk about what the challenges are in the industry. So there is that dialogue, I think, happening. Um, uh, another group that I'm involved with called the Fintech Growth Syndicate um, also has been pushing this idea of a sandbox where there is more 
collaboration and opportunity to share uh, experiences. I mean, there's you know, it's a funny thing about collaboration. It's 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 tricky because people have proprietary tech that they want to protect and IP, etc. But there's real benefits to obviously working together and and uh, to combat common problems and challenges. So I think there's again more of that happening now. With uh, you know, we see that certainly banks. A, a few years ago, when I started with OnDeck, it was. Uh, the view, I think, in the industry was fintechs and alternative uh, lenders, et cetera, versus banks. Now it's much more of a partner mm-hmm. mentality and an ecosystem of where can where can all these different vendors find common ground and work together to make Canada a stronger marketplace for fintech, for for uh, technology in general. That, that's awesome. Uh, I imagine some of you here probably have those problems with regulations. Anybody here? No, right now? There is another aspect as well that I would like to add is uh, when the regulation is already existing and is not fitting very well with the evolution of technology. I see that it's something that is parallel to fintech, which is the insurance tech. Uh, and in the world of insurance, which is highly regulated, I will give you just a very simple uh, example. Uh, auto insurance today, you... You have any, any insurance company has to provide the regulator with one pricing schedule that can change only once a year, and it has to be given by an actuary and signed by, by an actuary. So forget about real-time optimization, machine learning, forget about that. So how do we now influence the regulator to adapt the rules in order to change and adapt to the technology. So I have been approached by insurance companies that are asking me to build price optimization models and I was very surprised. I said, but you have actuaries to do that. It's not our job. So now we see a colliding path between the actuaries and the data scientists, the actuaries that are totally controlled by the regulator but the insurance are asking the data scientists to work freely in order to put some algorithm in the side that are going to work in parallel. So in two years, they can go back to the regulator and see see how much money we lost as an opportunity cost because we cannot adapt to the new technology because the rules are too straight. So it's another approach as well. Okay. Um, so we can go to the second question, perhaps. Um, with the development and success of some of FinTech, the great players of the digital universe begin to look at this segment. Uh, is there a risk that a risk that uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and other major companies will acquire fintech in the future? If it's possible to estimate the results of this type of merger for users, especially in regards of privacy. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't know how about. I'm not sure about the second part, the estimation okay. of the impact, but I, I guess the. You know, for, for most fintechs, they have uh, either a, an exit strategy, which might include being uh, consumed by a, one one of the large uh, FAN companies, uh, or it could be to uh, to run the business for a longer time horizon. But I think that you know, the good news about regulation, and certainly Canada has benefited from some of the regulation we have. We've been a very conservative uh, uh, economy and a government approach to. Uh, to regulation and that allowed us to avoid some of the drama of 2008. Um, yeah. So, some of the conservatism, I think, is was a good thing for Canada. But no matter who buys the fintech, they still are subject to the same privacy regulations and restrictions and financial uh, requirements of of all the existing uh, banks and fintechs in Canada. So I don't think they get any passes. And you've seen, you know, with the rollout of the GDPR regis- uh, legislation in the in Europe, there's been an impact. Now we're seeing it in all over the world. Mm-hmm. Lots of I think everyone I don't know how many people have had to re re uh, connect on about a thousand newsletters this week, like I have. It's like <laughs> every day more and more newsletters coming in saying, "Please, we love you," and agree to keep getting this. So um, all those regulations are going to continue to be an issue for. Any company that acquires, and I think we in the lending space at OnDeck, you know, worried about Amazon making a decision, for example, to step into small business lending because they have more cash than most countries have. So, uh, yeah, they can always come. I think it could be uh, net positive, it could be net negative. It depends on how those businesses uh, get in, uh, ingested into the larger business. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, Roger? Well, the, 
obviously uh, everywhere in the world the, the GAFAs are going to be the first one because they have the money and they have the data. And the most important is actually the data even more than the money. Uh, in order to acquire all those little fintech and make them even better than what they are today. Uh, Canada could be a little bit different because we all know the specificity of Canada is the very high level of aggregation of the financial world. So we have only five banks, right? So uh, they are very, very strong. It means that at the difference of anywhere else in the world, uh, in Canada, it's the banks probably that will be the best position to acquire the fintech. Uh, and it's probably part of the exit strategy of all the fintechs today in Canada is to be acquired by a bank. We saw it with the telcos. We saw it work with the telcos. Today, you do not have one independent telco anymore. All the little ones, Wing Mobile, etc. they all have been acquired, all of them. Uh, so why it would be different in the banking industry at one moment, all the fintech is going to be acquired by the banks. It seems ineluctable in the, in, the, in the world, in the Canadian world. But everywhere else in the world, uh, yes, the GAFAs will be probably the, the best position ones. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, the, the question about privacy was more because, uh, you know, um, the collecting data from Facebook and yes. Google, you know, is yeah. massive. Like, uh, yeah. they already have a lot of data. Like, uh, do you think that in some point that will be conflicted when they start to you know, acquire fintech companies and also dominate the fintech, the, the financial market at some point? I don't think it will be conflicting at one moment. It will depend on all the rules that are going to be put together and are put together uh, currently to, uh, to manage some level of, of privacy. And we see the evolution of the technology as well, actually. There are some very interesting ideas that are floating to use different kind of data and different level of anonymization and different level of aggregation of data that allows to uh, to go around all the issues that we can have. So yeah. I think it's going to work. And I think the you know the all the drama around the uh, the election in the U.S. with yeah. what Facebook uh, was doing, I think, has raised the veil a little bit on what the data is capable of and how it can be uh, used to manipulate in different ways than was imagined. So I think. You know, the GDPR re uh, legislation and that change of approach is going to have an impact on how we are given opportunities to pull our data back. I think, uh, you know, it's not the right person to speak on the potential impact of blockchain, but I do believe that when you imagine a, a future where blockchain allows an individual to control their identity more, I think we'll have more options to pull and own our own data and our own profile information in a more uh, extreme way. So I think that'll change the landscape a little bit. But obviously, if uh, big companies acquire fintechs and start to merge data sets together, that's going to be something governments pay very close attention to, I think. Sounds good. Now, we go to the third and last question. This is the last question, and we want you to probably think about what do you want to ask to our panelists after this discussion uh, about fintech. So many startups in the fintech industry and others suffer, uh, suffer from lack of history, historical uh, data. Some traditional players collect this data for a long time and keep jealousy <laughs> because of ignorance. Uh, our society will benefit from initiatives aiming uh, at aggregating data and opening its access. So what, what will it take for the banks and the insurance companies and uh, to put together the data together, you know, and in the other hand, how they can, how can startups compensate for the lack of historical data to remain competitive? Well, that's a big issue. It's a big, it's it's, it's a big question on the side of a modeler. You know, as a modeler, you're always looking at historical data in order to build your model, and it's always the challenge to find the good quality historical data, something that that makes sense. <clears throat> In the world of finance and in the world of fintech, it's something that actually uh, we, uh, we met a long time ago in the world of the, of the credit bureaus. I've been working for credit bureaus for 20 years. And uh, on the commercial side, for more than 20 years, all the credit bureaus have been working with proxy data because they never had access to the bank data, which is the truth. The only truth, the only reality of how any company is repaying a loan uh, is, resides with the bank and the bank never wanted to share it. So they always have been working with proxies. Uh, 
the credit bureaus have been working for years to try to convince the Canadian banks, at least here in Canada, the Canadian banks to put the, the data together. Uh, there has been the beginning of something, but even that didn't really work. Uh, one of the five is claiming to have 50% of the market. So he's telling, well, we are going to give you the data and you are going to, we are going to buy it back to you because half of the model is going to be without data. Uh, it makes sense somewhere, but it's not really participative. Right? So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real challenge. So it means that it's going to force the fintech and the modelers to try to find other sources of data. And it's not bad because it, it's, it's forced to be creative. Uh, look at what's happening in, uh, in the developing countries, especially in India and in Africa. Uh, they are looking at other sources of data. To, today, a very trendy source of data for fintech is the telco data. There is a huge correlation between how you are using your phone and how you are using your different data on your phone and managing the long distance, uh, for example, on your phone, and how you are repaying your loan. So we are bypassing and finding other sources of data that are correlated. So there is always a way of doing it. Uh, but ideally, it would be to convince the owners of data to put the data together. How to do that? There are the barriers to be blocked is mainly ignorance. For having talking with most of the banks and the people that have the data, I found a lot of ignorance that is leading to uh, fear. I don't know, so I'm afraid, so I don't do anything. Uh, we have to look at the origin of it is the I don't know. So create some education and in order to, after that, have another kind of behavior. But the origin is that. I don't know, so I don't do anything. But Yeah, and I, w I guess I would add, that in, you know, in the UK, the solve for open data was legislation that forces oh, the sharing of data. Yep. So... I think, uh, you know, there's more recognition here as well. And as the Canadian Bankers Association has come out and said they have concerns about sharing data for security and privacy uh, reasons. And I don't think those are crazy uh, concerns to have. That Whether they're real or not, I'm not sure. Uh, because even we see big banks like BMO and CIBC got hacked this week. So, you know, there are real concerns about data and, and sharing of data. And as you say, if you know one bank controls a, a big chunk of it, what, what's the motivation for them to share? So I'm not sure whether we'll get there through a a discussion and an agreement that we should do it because it's better for the for the business or better for for individuals. I think we may get there because the government says, in order for Canada to flourish as an economic innovator, as a fintech innovator, we must have the data, and the data really doesn't belong to the to anyone anyway. It belongs to the people who created the the data, right? So, I think ultimately maybe that's back to the blockchain solution. Is it my data or the bank's data? Um, not sure, but. Ultimately, I think there's more discussion now. Canada, through the, the report that was done last fall, they recognize there are gaps in our our APIs and how we sh don't share data. Uh, so I think there is a belief that we need to get better at doing it, how fast that will happen, and whether the next government will have a will to enforce that. I'm not sure, but I think that's likely one more positive or, or likely uh, path to success of open data would be uh, legislation forcing it, and then and then all the players figure it out. Once you say it must happen, yeah. then the players will figure out how it happens. Perfect.